Travis Sully, DOC number 716736. You are a first class offender. Eligibility date 7 5 2021. Good time date 1 7 2022. Full term date 4 3 2030. Your 15 year sentence. Uh, and false imprisonment with dangerous weapon, domestic abuse, aggravated assault. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir. Answer, Mr. Uh, Tony Mayor Bell's question. Mr. Uh, Soleil, is that how you pronounce your name? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Soleil, my name is Tony Maribel. I've got a few questions I'd like to ask you, okay? Yes, uh, uh, you're 41 years old, is that correct? Yes, sir. How long have you been in prison on these charges? Six years. It'll be six years six. in April. Okay. And you have a 15-year sentence, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I notice on your, your rap sheet, this is your only arrest. Have you ever been arrested for anything before? I just, like traffic, I had traffic tickets, but I never went Other than, I'm talking about criminal offenses. No, sir. Any kind of violence or anything like that? No, sir. Okay. Tell me what was going on here with you at that time. I mean, I, I, I've read the report, I've seen what's going on. Tell me what, what caused all of this. It was just trying to keep a marriage together, and I was trying to love somebody that didn't want to be loved. And like I said, it was just a, I guess I don't want to say a spur of the moment deal. It was just really just trying I to mean, keep did, something together. Did, did you have a gun? Not on me at the time, no, but I did buy one. Yes, sir. Well, I mean, it's my understanding there was a gun involved in this case. You saying no? No, sir. I said, yes, sir. They did have a gun. Yes, sir. You had a gun with you at the time? It was in my, it was at the house. Yes, sir. So, so tell me what motivated you to do what you did. They were just trying to keep a, keep a marriage together. Were, were you but, drinking or on drugs had, or anything? I had a little bit of alcohol. Yes, sir. You had been drinking that day? Yes, sir. What had you been drinking? I had a uh, crown and Sprite. And how much did you have to drink? It was uh, about a pint, maybe. And what time of day was this? The kids were going to school. So what so time early, of day? Was early in the morning. And you had already had a pint of alcohol? How often do you drink? Or how often did you drink back then? It was basically like on the weekends. You consider yourself to have a drinking problem? No, sir. Well, how often would you drink a pipe of whiskey in the morning? That was just that one time, sir. And so why did you do it that one time to go to your house with your ex-wife and your children? Nerves, felt nerves. Well, I, I I hear that, and I'm afraid of that. So, what what nerve did you need? What did you need the whiskey to go over there and have a gun available and, and do what you did? I, I'm trying to figure out what caused you to do what you did and whether you've addressed it, but I, I can't seem to get to what the root cause was. What caused all of this? It's anger. Okay, anger at what? At her finding out the, the way she uh she was cheating on me with a friend of ours. Were y'all legally separated? We were going through the separation. And it's I understand it, it, your children were living in the house that the two of you lived in at one point? Yes, sir. They still live in at that house, sir. I understand. And you would live there for 14 days and your wife would live there for 14 days. Y'all would alternate, like on 14 on, 14 off, right? Yes, sir. And you would go over there. Was this court ordered or was this something y'all just agreed on? Well, we agreed on the 14 and 14. It was still court ordered, but we did it the 14 and 14. So I hear you, but it was a court ordered 14 and 14. Yes, sir. Even though you agreed to do it. Yes, sir. A lot of times in family court, domestic courts, 
things are contested, but the parties agree. Okay, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. That doesn't mean that's a loose arrangement because you agree. When a judge signs a document, you are required to maintain those rules. Okay, so you were going over there when it wasn't your turn to be there. And this happened to be one of those days, right? Yes, sir. Did you rape her as she suggests? No, sir. You had sex with her? Yes, sir. With a gun? Yes, sir. So tell me what you've done while you've been in prison to address some of your anger issues. I took like 14 self-help rehabilitation classes as far as uh, Cajun Rage. I took, I'm in the STAR program. I'm involved in a PILUS program. I got my GED. I did, um, So tell me what you tell me what you learned or how you're going to be able to address your anger issues. What have you learned? You said you took Cage of Rage and a few other anger management courses. Tell me what you've learned about your own anger, what makes you angry, and how you can control that. Well, we learned about our like trigger points and how to you know we suggest how to deal with them. Better. What are your trigger points? But trying to be taken advantage of, that's one. You know, lie, being lied to. Okay, those are things that happen that other people do. What happens to you when those things happen to you? Uh, I mean, what goes on in your head? What What have you learned? How do you deal with those trigger points? Now it's kind of just walking away, listening to music, the workout, and just, you know, isolating myself away from the problem. What have you done about your drinking problem? I just gave that up. Well, I mean, you're in prison, yeah. and it's easy to give up drinking while you're in prison. What and have you done to address the underlying drinking problem? I'm just going to stay away from it. Just stay away from it and just not do it. And just more concentrate on myself <laughs> health-wise and try to build a relationship with my kids when I do get out. Well, let's, let's talk about this for a second. Some of your triggers about anger is people who wrong you, people who take advantage of you, uh, that also are triggers to drinking. Yes, sir. So you you seem to have addressed some issues, although you didn't give me any specifics. You said you'd walk away from the anger part. What about the alcohol? How are you going to be able to deal with you get out, uh, things go bad, somebody takes advantage of you? How are you going to not have a drink? How are you not going to get angry about that? Tell me what you're going to do to prevent those things. I'm just going to stay away from the more high risk situations. And well, what if you can't stay away from those high risk situations? What if you get out, you get a job, you like your job, and all of a sudden your boss comes in and says, we're cutting force. I can't keep you anymore. You ain't got a job. First thing you might want to do is have a little nip so you can feel better. How are you going to stop that urge? Well, being involved in this star program, we got a little a, uh, a shot and a pill that you can take to create that cuts your cravings and cuts the urge. And dealing with that is just going to help me better myself as a person, and then to stay away from stay away from alcohol altogether. Are you familiar with the twelve step program? I have I have the book. I've been reading it. And tell me about it. 12 step programs, it, it kind of helps you deal with situations and your alcohol problems. You go through like the first step. Like, I don't know the, the, the steps offhand because we just got the book. 
and just started reading it. But it's so you I'm, haven't you haven't had any work with the twelve step program. You, have you ever gone to an AA or an NA meeting? When I was younger, like out of the mean? world. When were you young? When did you go to an AA meeting when like, you were younger? I, I think I was like seven years old. You went to an AA meeting then? It was because one of my uh, a situation happened with my with my dad that we had to uh, we had. I understand to you had someone in your family who was an alcoholic, and you went to a meeting with them. Was it an AA meeting or an Al-Anon meeting? I think it was an AA meeting at the it was called at the Easy Does It. Okay, you went there with someone else. Have you personally, for yourself, ever gone to an AA meeting? No, sir. <laughs> Where do you intend to stay if you get out? At my mom's house. Okay. Have you had any contact with your children? Not since I've been in here. Okay. Uh, is there any prohibition from you contacting them? I just don't have no cell phone numbers. I have my son's cell phone number, but he's living at, at the house of my ex-wife and I guess he pays the bills on the phone and she don't let them accept phone calls. Uh, th there's really little you can do about this, but law enforcement is very much opposed to your getting out. Yes, sir. Uh, the victim is opposed to your getting out. Uh, can we maybe hear from uh, Warden Booty? Can we? Tell us a little bit about uh, how uh, Mr. Soleil is doing there. He's been with me uh, for three years since 2018. He's uh, presently uh, orderly for a shift supervisor. He uh, does a lot of work for the shift supervisor, and uh, he's had no DB report since he's been here. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think that's all the questions I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Jones. I don't have any questions. Mr. Maribel did a good job on it. All right, thank you. Now we're here from Ms. Jamie. Would Ms. Jamie like to make a statement? Hi, this is Jamie. Okay, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, Travis has always been a good family oriented person. He worked hard to give his kids a good life. He went without so his kids could have what they needed and wanted. He's never, he was never one to get into trouble or cause problems with anyone. He, is, he was always a good brother to my siblings and myself. He has a big heart. Anybody who knows Travis knows he's a big teddy bear. He worked for Gulfstream Services for 15 years. They actually want to hire him back once he gets out. He also has another job offer with Next Tier Solutions. It's based out of Texas. All right, thank you. Is that it? Yes, sir, that's it. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Travis, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? I just want to say, with, with all the stuff that happened that got me in, in prison, I'm not that same person anymore. I kind of grew up and learned and kind of learned how to focus on myself. And, you know, all that, I left all that stuff behind. You know, I'm a, I'm a, better, I'm a better person in, inside and out. And the, my main focus is to get my relationship back with my kids and get a job to make money and to move forward. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Madam Fair to vote. Yes. Mr. Marabella. Mr. Soleil, uh, I've read the police report. Yes, sir. And I've read uh, the statements uh, of, of what happened. Uh, it seems to me that you are downplaying a little bit of what happened in this case. Uh, 
you had a gun. Uh, you pled guilty. A judge sentenced you to 15 years, 10 years, and five years consecutively. Uh, there is law enforcement opposition. Uh, you have apparently, uh, in my opinion, from what you've told me today and what I've seen, uh, a problem with alcohol. Uh, you have taken some classes, uh, and that's a good thing, and I commend you on that. Uh, I think it's critical that you learn more about the 12-step program and AA meetings and that sort of thing for you to be able to function once you get out. Alcohol and anger are a bad combination. And uh, I just think you need a little more programs and a little more understanding about what your issues are for you to be able to uh, meet the world when you get out. Uh, you do have law enforcement opposition. You have victim opposition. Uh, Based upon all of those things, I'm going to have to vote today to deny your parole. Mr. Jones? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, my vote is uh, the same. I, I'm voting to deny for the same reason as stated. All right, you have two votes to deny your parole. Also, I'm going to vote to deny your parole for the same reasons as stated. Three votes to deny your parole has been denied. Good luck. Yes, sir. All right, Travis. Yeah, I mean, the man legit is not taking any accountability. We'll go over the details. Uh, you heard in his final statement, I'm sorry for what happened. That's what he's, I'm sorry for what happened. No, 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 not what happened, what you did. But it's like he's in denial or something. Oh, no, I, I only, I, I had the weapon on me, but it was completely consensual. Okay, man, yeah, it was completely consensual. You're, I'm sure, I'm sure it really, it really was. Uh, it's just... It's just aggravating. Uh, and, you know, I wish they would have drilled in on that. Um, I really do. But they, because he did take a plea deal for not, not having those charges, I don't know. It doesn't. But they're still making him take those programs. But it, it's just it's just a broken scissor. It's a scary, what a scary man. Um, so I can share the screen here uh, to the stage now what's weird about this case is that they were initially investigating um an offense of a child and i don't know if they're investigating him it's not clear or if they were investigating someone else when they heard this but they said that uh he came into you know his ex-wife's home with a weapon uh verbally assaulting and then a threat um then assault of a sexual nature and uh, the incident occurred at home, and, and um, additional details not available. Meanwhile, the police department got a report of another aggravated assault of a sexual nature. Friday, spokesman David said he said the victim is a prepubescent, but declined to give exact age. And I don't know what that means. They really they don't provide any more details. I'll put the link in the description. They have a suspect, charges appear unlikely, but charges appear unlikely. Oh, what a surprise. We finally, we're looking into the allegations. We're not saying it's definitely happened, he said. It looks like the suspect's name is going to be cleared based on the investigation. So maybe it, it was it the same man, was it a different? I really, I can't not tell. Now that article was written in 2015. Then we fast forward to this one written in 2016. And it says that the charges change charges change be pled guilty so they dropped the man originally charged with assault of a sexual nature pled guilty today to two non-sexual nature charges one of um of his attorney said he was 37 he pled guilty to false imprisonment while armed with a dangerous weapon and domestic abuse aggravated assault uh so he took that plea deal and the state district judge, um, no, 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 he said it was consensual. They they did it consensually. But the, he had a gun, but it was consensual. He, he can you believe he said that at his parole hearing? I really wanted them to 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 give it to him, but they didn't. And that's annoying. Um, they sentenced him to ten years and five years. The max we gave him both the maximum, and they are running. 
uh, consecutively. So he, he got the judge at least saw through it and gave him the maximum for what the DA has brought. What I can say is that the judicial system worked, said the DA in an, in an email. Sometimes it takes a couple of days of trial to fully understand the facts and make sure the proper crime fits. Kudos to the state for arriving at the proper conclusion and maintaining professionalism through the process. We are satisfied with the outcome. Yeah, okay. Uh, how is that the proper crime? You should have just gotten her in the entire thing. If convicted of the aggravated assault, he would have been facing mandatory life sentence. Wow, really? Without the possibility of probation or parole. Huh. Uh, the district attorney's office on Friday uh, offered him 25 years in prison in exchange for a guilty plea on another charge, but he refused. So the DA said, I'll give you 25 years. And he said, no. Or he said that the sentence would have been served without the possibility of probation or parole. So then they began the trial. So the DA did play some poker. They said, okay, we'll give you 25 years. He said no, and they went to trial. And um, it began with jury selection, which continued Tuesday morning. The attorneys gave their opening statements and began calling witnesses to testify. In his opening statement, he pointed out inconsistencies in the victim statements, including whether Solette was holding the weapon or she saw it on the counter and how the weapon ended up under the bed. The woman also first alleged a struggle and then said she agreed to have uh, when to have sex uh, because she was afraid. So because she had inconsistencies on the stand, they're saying, oh, man, the jury might, who knows what the jury would say. Ori told the jury that Celette had consumed alcohol and male enhancement pills the day of the crime. He said Celette and the woman had sex, but he refuted that it was not consensual. District Attorney Deanna Sanders and Heather Hendricks prosecuted the case. They cannot be reached for comments. So according to this, he uh, they did, to their credit, they did take it to trial and they didn't like what they saw there, I guess. She wasn't the best witness on the stands. She maybe changed, um, you know, the cross-examination made her look uncertain. And then they, they negotiated on the deal and they took it. That's what happened here. And um, that's what can happen on these cases, I guess. So we're seeing some insight into that. And maybe they felt they had to take the 15-year deal. They didn't want to risk a mistrial. You know, I, I guess once she started changing her story, whether she thought she he had it or and, but don't take don't take me wrong. I believe her completely. I believe that she was threatened. Uh, she felt her life was threatened. Um, but in the cross examination, they tripped her up and they felt that a jury might they probably felt the jury might not. Uh, juries can be finicky. That That's my guess. But. Yeah, he the guy doesn't seem to have learned anything. <laughs> He's like, I'm sorry for what happened. You know, he went there with premeditation and a weapon. That's kind of all you need to know. But, um, love to hear your thoughts. See you in the next one. 8032, you are a second class offender. Parole eligibility date 5 18 20, 000, 2008. Not eligible for a good time. Full term date 5 18 20, 2023. Uh, you're since aggravated burglary. On aggravated burglary on 5 18 2008. Uh, it was reduced from an aggravated burglary, forcible rape, and simple kidnapping. That sound correct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Um, tell me, uh, tell me how old you are. I'll be, I'm 73, I'll be 74 in October. How long have you been incarcerated? Uh, 
40-some years. How many? 40-some. That's how long you've been down? Now, didn't you, you get out and you, didn't you, weren't you down for a little while and got out and then got, went back in jail? What happened? Yes, sir. How long were you going? 30. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, sir. 30 years. So you, you were in jail, you got out and then got right back in. Is that what happened? Yes, sir. How long did you spend the first time? Uh, 19, I think. And how long did you spend this time? Uh, 30. Uh, 32 or 33. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, right at 30 years. Okay, so, okay. So you've been down for a total of 30 years, or 30, 30 plus the 19, 49 years? 30 plus. So tell me what, uh, when did you get out? When did you get out after those 19 years? Do you remember when that was? Uh, no, sir. 1992. 1992. Okay. And then you got right back in trouble, right? Yes, sir. You came right back in. Tell me, tell me when the last, your last disciplinary write up you've had. Oh, uh, it's been 10, 10. So, 2007. 2007. What what kind of classes program? What have you been doing with your time? What's going on? I've been uh, I've taken I've got a uh, in uh, horticulture. I got a went through horticulture, and uh, I went through uh, that uh, reentry program. Okay. Have you ever taken any anger management or any any type of substance abuse or? Um, no, sir. Did you ever have a substance abuse problem any time in your life? No, sir. What caused you to get in all this trouble then? I don't. It just I, it wasn't alcohol or nothing like that. Well, what was it you think? I, I really, I really don't know what was going on. I mean, I, I'd, I'd go out and party and drink beer and stuff and like that, but I didn't, I wouldn't have a problem with it where I had to have it, things like that. What about doing some drugs, doing a little drugs? Oh, no, sir. That's something I never seen with. Do you have any type of mental health problems, anything you're taking medicine for or doing anything for? No, sir. Ever been diagnosed with any type of mental health problem? No, sir. Um, do you have a high school diploma or GED? GED. You have anything beyond that? So you have horticulture and GED. You've done some reentry. You've been down a long time. I suspect you had an opportunity to do a whole lot, right? Have you taken anything else? Any any type of uh, classes for yourself, sex offender classes, any kind of again I anger did, classes. I did go through the sex sex offender thing. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have to get it started when uh, when I come back in here and uh, when I come back over, got back over here. You take all the phases. Yes, I have. I have to get the books and all together and all. Uh, yeah. Um, you completed phase four, right? Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Okay. You completed phase four, okay. And um, anything else that you're doing? What do you do with your time? What are you a, a, currently a trustee? What do you do? I'm a, I'm a barber, and I, I cut hair for uh, different ones, and I keep all the equipment stuff running and fixed. And, uh, Are you a trustee? No, sir. Any reason why not? You charge? It could be. I don't know. I can't. I don't know. I've never uh, asked for a trustee position because I'm mm -hmm. working stuff. So you cut hair during the day, and what else do you do? I cut. Uh, I cut hair, and then, uh, well, I 
I talked to a lot of guys on to go to church. You do any work just around there though? Any type, anything else yes, around sir. there? Yes, sir. I help out with different things. Sometimes I help out the dorm and stuff and um, whatever whatever might be done. Run errands for for the officers and things. Okay. What's your plans if you were to be released? Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? Well, when I get out, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to take care of my parents and my mom. Uh-oh. There we go. Whoops. You're back on mute. Go ahead and tell me again. You're going to take care of your parents and put you on mute again. We were on mute over there at David Wade. Start off where you were talking about taking care of your family. Yeah, tell me about taking care of your parents. Yes, sir. My, my mom's got dementia. And my dad's got a bad heart and a bad hip, and uh, I'm gonna take care of uh, I'm gonna take take care of them and look after them. And uh, I want to go into uh, I cut hair. I'm real good. I want to do some charity work out there. I want to be able to the homeless people and the shut ins and uh, Things like that. I want to be able to go and, and cut their hair and take care of them. Are so you going to the same area that you got in all this trouble? Oh no, sir. Where are you going? Oh, I'm I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, well, it's close by. I'm gonna be at Western Road right off. I'll be uh, in uh, Collinson. I want to stay with my sister in Collinson. That's in Mohouse Parish. That's Parish North of Washington, Mr. Taylor. All right, thank you. And so you're gonna live with your parents, is what you say. I'm gonna I'm gonna live with my sister, then I'm gonna take and be go and go over with my uh, uh, take care of my parents. Warden, you got some input for me here. I can tell you a lot about Garland uh I've known to be Back in the 80s, I guess. Garland's, uh, he's our lead barber. I mean, he, he didn't do a good job of playing. He works seven days a week. He takes care of our barber shop. He takes care of our equipment in the barber shop. He cuts hair. He's still capable of cutting hair. Uh, he's been through lots of educational programming throughout his incarceration. He's done a lot of programming. So Garland's getting a little age on him as well, and he's, uh, you know, he, his, maybe his memory isn't as good as it should be. Uh, his mom and, and, and stepdad uh, used to visit pretty regular, and I got to know them pretty good, talk to them every time we came. And, you know, they're, uh, uh, you know, Garland's 72, so that, you know, his, I think his mother's in her 90s, and she does have, uh, she's got a horse she can't drive when she does have uh, uh, dementia, and, and, and the stepdad falls, they can't drive, so he really doesn't get to visit other than over the telephone, but uh, you know, I don't know what to tell you about Garland. Uh, uh, you know, he's a model prisoner, he doesn't get right up, he's very cooperative with staff, he works hard, and, and I'll be glad to answer any questions uh, that y'all may have about him. Uh, you know, his records kind of speak for itself. He, he got a, a commutation of his sentence on that original charge. Uh, I think he got his time set to 36 years and he was released, went back to the Washita Parish area and i think he stayed out maybe two years was picked back up and has been incarcerated ever since so garland's been incarcerated most of his adult life other than a couple of years uh, he, he's done very well here in prison i can't say anything negative about his behavior and attitude and conduct and, and willingness to assist i mean he's uh he's, he goes above and beyond to do anything that staff here needs him, needs him to do and he's always been like that he's been like that since i've known him and i've known him for 30 years about it so anyway i'll be glad to answer any questions you may have all right else? thank you warren yes all right i have no no more comments uh mr roche yes thank you mr chairman uh warden i do have some questions please right. um it actually it wasn't a couple of years it was like five or six months he got out in November of 92 and was rearrested in May of 93. Okay. So it, it was only five or six months. Except for those five, six months, he's been incarcerated uh, since 73. 
Yes, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure your records are, are accurate. I was just speaking from memory. I know he was down here for a couple of years. I think he may have went to East Carroll and some other places before he ended up back here. But. Well, my, my report doesn't list any programs. Can you go over the programs that he's completed? Because uh, my pro my my information says that he hadn't completed any. Okay, well, you know, some of them go back pretty far. But like he has a, a well, first, he has first, let, let, let me do this then. Okay. Uh, has he completed all four phases of sex offender treatment? He indicated that he had, but I can't find that in his record, Mr. Rose. That's not in his record. But I looked through his entire record unless he did it in 1992. Uh, and I don't think we had that program going at that time, so I, but I could not yeah. find it in his record. No, I, I could not find it either. Uh, is he completely? He, 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 he put he helped put behind the books at least. You know, he probably was uh, sharpened the pencils and had the paperwork laid out. I mean, I'm, I, I would agree that he did that, but whether he had to participate in the program, I cannot confirm that. I would not think he had a record that was like that. And I'm looking at his master record, and basically, uh, he has been in a lot of local facilities, and David Wade, and that's about it. Yeah, I've been trying to get to Angola back in the early in the 70s and 80s before he came to Wade. Yeah, he, has, he has completed the pre release uh, programming back in 2008. He completed that when we first started that program. Uh, all the re entry programming that, that goes along with the pre release, he did complete that. He has a certificate of completion for that. He's been involved in the Human Relations Club. Uh, he got his. Uh, Horticulture degree, you got a. Uh, well, I have, I have all, all that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just interested in the sex offender treatment because he did, he did a 19 year stint for aggravated rape. He, he received a golden ticket from Governor Edwards. He commuted his sentence from a life to 36 years. Was granted parole. And five months later, he committed the same crime. That's, that's yeah. correct. But they let him plead and, burglary instead of those. Yeah. And, and without without any sex offender treatment, I'm very concerned, even at the age of 73. Uh, and do you, have, do, you have any, do you have any resemblance? Of sex offender treatment at David Wade. Uh, yeah, we do provide the Dr. Cohen uh, program here, four phase program. We have that program available for the offenders at David Wade Correctional Center. And how long usually does it take to complete that program? Uh, it depends on the individual whether they whether they progress uh, on their own if they need tutors, but it's usually. Uh, every two months, they can complete a phase, so probably uh, eight eight months to a year would be the common would be the normal time to complete the program. Nine months to a year. So, so po possibly he could complete it if it was accelerated in nine months. Uh, yes. Sir. Hang on, we get a chance to talk, bro. I'm sure Mr. Rose on give me a chance to talk. Uh, I I will listen. I, and, and I must say, Mr. White, I do I do have some concerns, um, and um, but I will listen and uh, act accordingly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Renato. Um, Mr. White, it looks like you want to say something. What do you want to say? Again, the second charge, the second charge, I was a, I was arrested for simple battery. We have all the details. You don't have to explain it to us. We have all the details. We know what happened. Okay. We have the police report and everything. Uh, but there was a sex offense involved in that in that crime. Uh, I share Mr. Roche's concerns about, uh, you know, you had, a, you had an arrest in 1972 for an aggravated rape. It was no bill. You had 1973 aggravated rape for which you were sentenced to life. And as we discussed earlier, 
you were commuted by Governor Edwin Edwards to a 36 year sentence released in 1992. And then about five or so months later, you were um, rearrested for what you're in jail for now. And I have uh, real, real concerns about your lack of sex offender treatment. So um, I don't have any particular questions of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, let's we'll hear from uh, Miss Vivian Martin, please. Sorry, took a while to get unmuted. Okay. I am Garland's uh, sister, Vivian Martin. Um, okay, I do believe that Garland has rehabilitated himself as his sister, knowing him and staying in close touch with him over the years. At his age, he's, he does have health problems. I don't be believe he's going to be a threat to society. <laughs> Honestly, I don't believe that he's ever going to. How do you say it and say it nicely? I don't think the sexual thoughts will even be there uh, due to his age and his um, health. I do know that we do need him home, and I know that. That may not mean a lot, but my mother yeah. does have Alzheimer's really bad. And we need, they only allow family to come in and take care of them. Um, my stepdad stayed on the floor and all for three days before anybody could get to a phone, before he could even pull himself to a phone. So he yeah. needs a lot of care, both of them. And we really need him there to help us. It's my sister and I. And I have another brother in West Virginia. I really honestly believe Garland's rehabilitated and no threat to society. And I believe that he will stay with good company at all times to make himself accountable to good company and never be left alone to himself to, uh, to lean prove that he's ready. I mean, you know. I don't know what else to say. All right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you Thank for your you. comments. All right, Mr. Uh, White, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Yes, sir. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. I, uh, I, uh, I've been involved with the church a lot and been, uh, that was one of my big things. I've, I've got a lot of uh, stuff that I completed in church and uh, I got different uh, stuff for that where I've completed different classes and all that. And uh, I am not the same person I was back when I was younger. I'm completely changed. My thought patterns and all that has changed. And uh, I did go through the re-entry program, which I pay attention to a lot very much. But uh, I, I got a word, I'll give you my word, that I won't, I won't let you or nobody else down. I got a lot of officers here in my family that I have that, that, that believe in me, and I, I'm not gonna let them down either. I have changed, I have really, really changed. And I'm not the same, I don't even think the same. And uh, I'm asking if you'll give me a chance, I won't let you down. And, uh, I want to take care of my parents because I don't think they're going to make it uh, for these two and a half years that I have left. I, I want to be with them. I want to make them proud of me while they still can recognize me and know me. That's my biggest thing. And, and I want to take care of them. I don't feel like that'd be a job. That'd be an honor because they stood by me all these years. And I'm just asking for a, a chance to get out there and take care of my parents before anything happens to them. And like I say, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll be 74 this year. And my age and, and everything is not the same as it was when you were younger. So I'm just asking if you'll give me a chance, I would appreciate it. I won't let you down. All right, thank you. All right, is the panel prepared to vote? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. White, um, you got a lot of positive, uh, you know, a lot of positive comments from the war and a lot of good things. 
uh, going on. You know, I, I think, you know, we all have similar concerns. The fact that uh, not your sentence commuted, the fact that you've had uh, multiple opportunities to get the sex offender treatment. I mean, you know, that's really something that's, that's kind of, uh, no matter how old you are, it just kind of sticks with me a little bit that, you know, you have had opportunity to get that class. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to see you at least complete it. I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, you're working hard. You're barber. Obviously, you're not you're in trouble. Or you, you're doing good things. I mean, I, I would think that the warden could help you get into that class and try to complete it over the course of the next eight months. Um, again, you spent a lot of time in jail. You've, you've done a lot of good things. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, pretty, uh, you're in a, a unique situation, but for me, I would like to see you, um, I'd like to see you get, just go ahead and spend that eight months and get that class. And if you do, then, then I would be inclined to, to, uh, to vote for you next time. But today I'm asked to vote to deny your parole, uh, because of, uh, law enforcement opposition, the victim opposition, and you don't have sex offender treatment after all this time. That's a little concerning to me, but that's my vote for today. Mr. Roche. Mr. Chairman, my vote is the same for the same reasons. Ms. Uh, Renatza? I do agree. I, I'm uh, disappointed in the lack of sex offender treatment, particularly after uh, the relief that was granted by Governor Edwin Edwards. Uh, my vote today is to deny based on the lack of sex offender treatment. Um, I wish you well. Yes, three, votes, three votes to deny your parole. Your parole has been denied. Good luck to you. And it's 9.55 a.m. We'll adjourn at David Wade. Thank you. Can you imagine he commits this crime, the first one, of what he does to a woman against her, against, you know, the governor, the governor commutes his sentence. So he had a life sentence, no opportunity for parole. We've seen it many times. The commutation board says, you know what, we'll, we'll grant, we think you've changed. We'll grant you a chance. The governor signs it. And within six months, even less, he commits the same crime. Now, they didn't charge him with the crime, but we'll go over the details of it. You'll get a sense. And maybe they didn't charge him because it's just Louisiana. Maybe they didn't because of politics. It would have looked bad on the optics. Governor commutes since within six months. And and I bet you he had a low risk score too, right? It's, uh, in my opinion, someone who does what he did. He's a danger at this age. He's a, To think that even he be in the vicinity of the infirm or with his a aging parents is scary to me personally. There's something going on here. But this is, this is the second time he was busted, right? This is in... Uh, so... Yeah, this is 1993. He spent his whole life locked up. Can you imagine? During the early morning hours of May 16, 1993, he left his apartment with the intentions of driving home. Because it was late and because she lived considerable distance from Mr. Croft's apartment, Miss Caskey stopped to call a friend to ask if she could spend the night at her home. Ms. Caskey called her friend from the payphone located outside the budget saver in West Monroe, Louisiana, but was unable to contact her. After Ms. Caskey hung up the telephone, a white car drove into the parking lot. A man wearing blue jeans, gray t-shirt, and sunglasses got out and approached her. Without speaking, the man, so he, no, he just walks up to her and, and he hits her in the face. and tried to drag her into his vehicle. Miss Caskey screamed, struggled with her assailant, urinated on herself. During the struggle, Miss Caskey and the attacker fell to the ground. Miss Caskey begged the attacker to let her go. He placed his hand over her mouth and told her she would not be hurt if she quit screaming. Miss Caskey continued to struggle. The, the attacker momentarily released her. Caskey immediately fled her car, uh, fled to her car. However, the attacker came after her again before she could close and lock the door. This is like out of out of the a terror movie, out of your worst nightmares. 
He just walks up without saying a thing, punches her, jumps on her. She's fighting back. She runs to her car. She gets in, but she can't lock it on time. He gets in. Then he punched her in the stomach. He pushed her down across the front seats and tried to get on top of her while leaning. And remember, this is he just got out of prison for doing the same crime. The governor signs his commutation sentence. The attacker placed his hand inside her shirt and touched her. During the attack, Miss Caskey continued to scream and begged her, her attacker to let her go. The assailant responded that he would not hurt her. She just stopped screaming and that he wanted to touch her. I, I just want to touch you. When the attacker stood up, Miss Caskey closed and locked the door. So then he stood up. And at that point, she was quick enough. She, she was able to close and lock the door. As she drove from the parking lot, she memorized the license plate of the white Buick Regal that the assailant was driving. And way to go to protect herself. She did everything perfectly, even getting the license plate. Miss Caskey returned to Mr. Croft's apartment. Mr. Croft uh, described Miss Caskey as hysterical. He testified that she was crying. Her face was bleeding. Her hair was messed up, and she had urinated herself. Mr. Croft also stated that Miss Caskey was repeating a number and begging him to write it down. So she's just repeating the same number, the license plate number. Patricia Sims, who was present at Mr. Cross's apartment when Ms. Caskey returned, also testified Ms. Caskey had blood on her face um, and, 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 and had uh, gone to the bathroom on herself. Ms. Simmons stated Ms. Caskey was panicked and kept repeating a number and asking them to write it down. Ms. Simmons wrote down the number as requested. Karen Freeman, a patrolman from the West Monroe Police Department, was dispatched to the Croft Department. An investigator reported the attack. Officer Freeman testified Ms. Caskey had blood around her nose and mouth and was crying and upset. Ms. Caskey described the attacker as 30 to 4 years old, white male, 5'6 to 5'8, 140 to 160, with dark sandy hair, wearing dark sunglasses, gray muscle shirt. Ms. Caskey also told police attacker was driving a white Buick Regal, the license plate number. After police determined the white Buick Regal was registered to the defendant, Detective Brent Chappelle drove to his residence and asked the defendant's mother and stepfather to have the defendant call him. Later that day, the defendant called detective and agreed to come into the police station after running several errands. Shortly thereafter, Captain Jerry Hayden at the West Monroe Police Department stopped a red Ford truck for failing to yield at an intersection. When the driver of the truck produced a driver's license bearing the name Garen White, Captain Hayden informed the man that he was wanted for questioning. The defendant stated that he had talked to the detective Chappelle and was going to come to the station later that day. Captain Hayden confirmed this information and the detective requested the defendant to come to the station immediately. According to the Captain Hayden, the defendant voluntarily agreed to follow him to the police station. Captain Hayden did not ticket the defendant for failing to, to yield and did not remember if he returned the defendant's driver's license to him. As the police station, the defendant denied any involvement in the attack and provided Detective Chappelle with his first names of three people who could be his alibi. The defendant refused to participate in a lineup, although the Detective Chappelle informed the defendant he was not under arrest. Detective Chappelle testified he would not be allowed to leave the police station. After taking a short statement from the defendant and then consulting with his chief and assistant district attorney, Detective Chappelle arrested the defendant on charges of simple battery. The defendant's picture was taken during the booking process and placed in a photographic lineup, which Ms. Caskey identified the defendant as her attacker. Subsequently, the defendant was charged with a bill of information of aggravated burglary and violation and attempted forcible assault of a sexual nature. The defendant filed motions to suppress the victim's identifica identification of him as well. Statement to the police during the hearing of these motions, the defendant denied that he failed to yield the oncoming car stated by Captain Hayden and he did not return his driver's license. The defendant also asserted that the police took his picture and allowed the victim to view the photographic lineup before arresting him. The defendant's motions were denied. The state severed the charges of aggravated burglary and attempted forcible and then tried the defendant on the charges of attempted forcible. However, a mistrial was declared after the jury was deadlocked. How is that possible? The state then filed an amended bill of information rejoining the charges. Uh, and proceeded to trial on both charges. So after the mistrial, they said, you know what, let's let's charge him for both. At trial, Tanya and Tessa te testified 
They knew Ms. Caskey and knew her reputation in the community. The two women testified Ms. Caskey's reputation of untruthfulness. Justine Chenault and the defendant's mother testified that she and the defendant's uh, laundry and he did not own a gray muscle shirt. Okay, sure. She and her husband also testified that when the defendant left her house several hours before the attack, he was wearing a Western style shirt without any undershirt. However, another defense witness, Charles Wesley, testified that on the night of the question, the defendant was wearing a gray undershirt that was visible. Uh, oh, that's a, a nightmare. You bring up a defense witness and, he's, and he says he was wearing uh, that gray undershirt. That's great. Great defense witness. The defendant uh, presented several alibi witnesses. Uh, Julie Russell testified that she and the defendant were approximately 7 p.m. Well, at least we know that they did charge him for these offenses. So it wasn't, uh, there was no collusion with the governor. Um, until on 7 p.m. on May 15th until 3.30 a.m. May 16th, Russell testified that she and the defendant were hanging out with friends at Cloyd Corners and at her house. Mr. Gray testified that witnesses of the defendant leave Miss Russell's home at 3.30 a.m. Miranda Trainer testified that she spoke with the defendant via Citizen Brand Radio when he left Miss Russell and saw the defendant return to Cloyd's Corner before 4 a.m. She further testified that he remained there for 45 minutes an hour before he left and drove home, followed by Miss Trainer and her husband. In summary, the defendant produced witnesses at trial who testified he was with them or in CB contact the radio with virtually the entire night of the attack. So that's the summary. He had the summary is he had alibis. A unanimous jury convicted the defendant of aggravated burglary. However, a verdict of not guilty was returned on the charge of attempted forcible sexual assault. Wow. Can you imagine being that woman going through that experience and then having a jury not believe you? You fight for your life. You go through and a jury does not believe you after you take the stand and everything. What? You know... What year was this? 1996, you know? And there's a reason why people don't like to go through the headache of reporting these things. Wow. Wow. I mean, like you're actually, imagine being a jury and saying, well, there's not proof that he did, that he tried to do that. <laughs> what? What about she's beaten up? What about, you know, they probably didn't allow that he had a previous record for it, but what about the fact that she said that he did do it? Isn't that enough along with everything else? But times have changed 96 to now, that's for sure. Now you don't even need any, you just need someone's word. The defendants appealed, he asserted 13 assignments of error, which may be da, 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 da. Uh, that's it. So, yeah, pretty amazing. And then that's why he was saying, "Well, I, I didn't, I wasn't convicted of that charge." But what, what was interesting is that it didn't make a difference. The judge knew, knew he had been, had at life once commuted, and the judge then threw the book at him. But still, it makes a difference for the victim. And yeah, he's like, "Well, I didn't even happen." They're like, "We know." That's what the board said. We know. And good for the board for saying that. For saying they know. That's important. But. No, you get life and you get out, and within months you do that. You don't. I, you, you don't. You know. You got to. You got to come out when you're in a wheelchair. You just don't. I just don't. The, the, he could still harm more people. There, there's no. I don't know. So, anyways, that's my thoughts on it. Thank you, Richard, for sharing the information. With that, I'll let you go. Fight as a second felony offender. You're currently doing a 10-year sentence for indecent behavior with a juvenile uh, out of Caddo Parish. Your parole eligibility date was July 29th, 2016. You don't earn good time, and your full term date is July 29th, 
2021. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Marabella. Good afternoon, Mr. Abshai. How are you? How are you doing, Your Honor? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Uh, how old are you, Mr. Abshai? 39, sir. And how long have you been in prison? Nine and a half years. You, uh, you were before the board, I think, uh, uh, let me see, when was my date? Back in 2018, uh, and it was, uh, you were denied at that point, and it was suggested that you get some more treatment. What sort of treatment, have, what, what sort of programs have you had since that last hearing? Uh, since last year, I completed living in balance, cage of rage. Uh, I'm one semester, four classes to complete my master's for Ashley. Uh, I've completed welding, or at least a portion thereof. And you, 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 you broke out. You broke up on me. Did you complete sex offender classes? Uh, that was the big. If you recall, that was the big upset last time. I went ahead and I completed uh, phase two and three. Uh, phase four is not recently currently available because you know it's a facilitator class, and because of the pandemic, we're pretty much at a standstill. But I have successfully completed all three phases. Tell me what you learned about about in the classes as it compares to what you did and who you are. Okay, one thing I've learned, and it's one thing that I can actually apply in all the classes I learned, is although the risk factors in this um, risk management class apply to sex offenses, one thing I learned is regardless of the scenario and the life, way life presents itself, each each risk factor can be applied separately. See, like this, I had a, I had a drug, uh, not a drug problem, excuse me, I had an alcohol problem, you know, although, so, you know, when I first started the program, I looked negatively at the program. But then I had to realize, hey, look, pirates on a ship, not a good support group. You hang around with the wrong people, gonna go to a bar. Go to a bar, go to prison. Start drinking, anger issues come up. You know, it's basically a chain reaction. And I learned that just like we're dealing with PTSD, once you identify your triggers, everything else will fall into place. And then once you take the triggers, risk factors, and everything to follow them into one, you truly can say you are more in control than you ever were. Let's talk a little bit about your, your drinking. You Are you an alcoholic? Yes, sir. Okay. Last and and tell me how we're gonna control that. Um, with the help of some really amazing people at this facility, I've been able to identify several of my triggers. And um, although I'm not gonna say, I know that I will be an alcoholic forever. The only thing that will end that is death. But, um, one thing I've learned through, like I said, a very good social service system here is I'm actually going to go out there and, you know, I'm going to go beyond AA. I'm actually going to sit down with a counselor and really gather my thoughts together in an environment where I don't have to do it. Here, it's easy. Out there, it's not. And that's the main thing that I'm going to have to stay focused on. Is AA important to you? Uh, without a doubt. I attended, when I made parole back in 2006, I was ordered to go. And I'll be honest with you, I AA shop until I found a meeting I was comfortable with. Let's talk a little bit about these these pictures you had on your computer, what happened with you uh, and uh, your stepsister. Tell me what you've learned about that. How are we going to deal with that? Um, it's going to be, and I know it's probably not going to sound correct, but it's a learning process. At that moment in time, I was making really, 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 really poor decisions, and I was on a collision course. My worst enemy was me. I didn't care about what I did, who I hurt. Anybody in my path was subject to a rap. While that doesn't incur that what I did was acceptable, it will never be acceptable. It should never be acceptable, actually. But at the end of the day, I can't say that I'm proud of what I did. I should be commended for what I did because there's no excuse. I mean, at the end of the day, how can I put this? It was really, it was, I, I could have cared less whether I lived or died. And I was just at my wit's end. And I mean, I really don't know what to say. I mean, it's a loss for words type thing. I mean, the, when I look in the mirror, I'm not happy with the man I saw. What is, have you had any contact whatsoever with your stepsister? No, sir. 
market. If she were here today, what would you say to her? Uh, mo the most common thing that most people would say is I'm sorry. But believe it or not, the first thing I would ask her, is there anything you'd like to tell me? Because sorry is just a word. You know, I step on your toe. I'm sorry. But there comes a time when sorry is just a word and it can't take away the things that you've done. So I what, what are your go ahead? I'm sorry. If you weren't finished, finish. She would express herself, and then we find a mutual meeting ground on how we can either find closure or realize that closure will never be done. Tell me your plan if you are to be released. Where are you gonna uh, live? I'm gonna stay with my mother okay. until I can get it, you know. From jump, I have a couple plans in place. Number one, I'm gonna finish my bachelor's degree. I'm too close to stop now. How much and longer you got? I got four classes. Okay. As it stands now, I'm going to graduate my bachelor's with magna cum laude, and I'm a, my major is um, communication studies, and I'm double minoring in religion and sociology. Um, I'm going to definitely continue with that. Um, I'm either going to re-enter the workforce in the oil field, or as my stepfather will explain to you shortly, he's willing to help me get through uh, truck driving school. Um, you know, there's several options on the table. If you check my work record, I'm not, I'm not afraid of work. Um, even while I'm in here, I was in welding until I got hurt. And even then I was working. Uh, I try not to be lazy, but you know, sometimes that overtakes. But in the long haul, my main thing is this, I'm going to get, it's not going to be sit back and do nothing. I know I got to hit the ground running and I'm prepared to do it. And regardless if I have to go flip burgers at McDonald's or pump gas to the hole in the wall gas station. The fact is I have responsibility and my first priority is getting my life back to where, not back to where it was, but at least in a comfortable spot where I'm not a 39 year old relying on other people to support me. Thank you very much, Mr. Abshire. I appreciate you talking with me. Uh, Madam Chairman, those are the questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Bell and Ms. Wise. Yes, good afternoon, sir. How you doing, Ms. Wise? I'm good. How about you? Fine. This is our third meeting. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> the first uh, you time mentioned, you mentioned military. You mentioned military service. T tell me about your military service. Um, <laughs> ain't much to tell. Um, I enlisted in 1999. I got out in September of 01. And worked okay. out the beginning, and then was the change. I allowed alcohol to play a major factor, and it ended up costing my entire. Okay, so you got this uh, dishonorable okay. discharge? Oh, ma'am, I got a general, got, I got a general under less than honorable. They took my alcohol use into consideration. Oh, okay, okay, oh, okay. So this has been going on a long time. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm not gonna say I had the best childhood, but if I was to sit here and tell you why I did it, it'd be nothing more than excuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, because you, you know, once you get become an adult, you know, you got to start making some decisions on your own. All right, then, that's all I had. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you. Mr. Absher, as I'm sure you already know, there is some opposition to your uh, early release. Uh, I'm sure that's been shared with you in your past hearings. Just want to be sure you're aware of that. Uh, I don't have any particular questions. We'd like to hear from uh, the warden there. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is warden Thompson. Um, I'm stepping in for Deputy Warden Borlon for the time being. Um, I was just looking at some of the information um, how like he has applied himself is forced to classes that was recommended from the tape, so that's very impressive. To include, I was looking at his disciplinary record, which uh, here he looked like he only had five, five disciplinary reports in his record, which is pretty good as well for the amount of time he has been incarcerated. Uh, pretty much that's all I can have. All right, thank you. Um, so let's see, let's hear from your mother. Ms. Ms. Salden, would, we'd like to hear from you if you could unmute your microphone. Okay, is that it? Yes, ma'am, go okay. ahead. Okay, um, I'm speaking for myself and his oldest sister, but I agree very much to what she wrote in her statement. It says, I am sorry that I could not attend today's meeting. I am a teacher and it's very hard in our current COVID situation to get substitutes. 
My name is Rose Hager and I'm Clifford's older sister. I'm writing this letter telling today to let you know uh, what I have observed in the changes that Clifford has made in the past years. I have been proud of the changes he has made academically and trying to better himself educationally. He has completed many different courses and has furthered the, his knowledge in several different academic areas. He has maintained good grades. He continues to help other inmates with their academic needs. I think that he has done well in trying to prepare himself for civilization outside of the prison setting. setting. His family will be here to support him in his transition back into society. I totally agree with that. Um, he has shown that he's grown up. I wasn't too much aware of the alcohol problem, but I know he needed to grow up. He really needed to accept uh, what he's done. And I, I've seen, especially lately, where that's exactly what's happened. He's, um, he's showing maturity much, much better than what he did before. Uh, that's about all I can think of right now. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. But he has, he has done very well uh, in the past, uh, coming down to this particular moment. And I'm happily right. taking them in when he gets out. All right. Well, thank you so much for um, being with us today and sharing those remarks. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Stark, would you like to say something? Yes, ma'am. I hope y'all can hear me. I drive a truck. It's, um, we can barely hear you. Okay. Yeah, I drive a truck for a living. And right now I'm, I'm up in Chicago, so it's going to be kind of hard for me to talk. But when he gets out, I got him a school, a truck driving school to go to. And uh, when he gets out of that, I'll train him myself. I've got 47 years experience. But yeah, uh, just give him a chance to get out so he can prove himself. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you. We appreciate. Uh... You spending time with us here today. I guess you're at work now. My truck's broke down. I'm in Chicago. Oh, oh <laughs> goodness. Well, thanks for uh, for managing to to share your remarks with us. We appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Absher, is there something a statement you'd like to make before we vote? Yes, ma'am. Um, you were actually the chairman of the Harris Court, and um, you know I want to say this time a lot of Mason money, you know, unorthodox. When I was denied, my father was extremely ill. And I had just gotten out of the block and you had decided that I wasn't mature. And I thank you for that. Because I was at a um, pivotal point in my life where I was still letting the old me creep up. The second hearing, uh, Ms. Wise uh, was also in attendance. Um, since that time, my dad had passed away. Previously for the first hearing, my wife had passed away. And this past May, my daughter committed suicide. Um, I've had to face a lot of issues, but at the end of the day, it's the person in the mirror that I can blame. Nobody else. You know, I can sit here and tell you how I bettered myself and everything else, but you know, let's face it, we bet our backs self on the back every day. And, you know, it could be for the tightest things and we say, hey, we're doing better. But the fact is I sit around and I listen to people talk about the changes I've made and this thing that I have. You know, can I say I wasn't the person I was when I came here? Definitely. You know, but the proof is in the pudding. When I go home, I know I'll be here, right? But at the end of the day, in 2006, the board took a chance off. They sent me home, completed a, term, completed a full term, did what I had to do, went out there and I got on the wrong path. And that's what I'm asking today. I'm asking for that same chance I got back in 2006. And just like back then, I got off October 2018. Yeah, I got until July, but you know, you know, I could tell you the things I need to do, but that's neither here nor there. All I can say is I'm asking for the change. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Mayor Bell, are you ready to vote? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Abshire, uh, you have a moderate risk assessment. You have uh, 
opposition from the victim in this case. And most everything I read in your report suggested that I was probably going to deny your application today for parole. Having listened to you, having listened to what you accomplished, having listened to the programs that you take, understanding where you are and believing that you believe those things. I, I think that since your last hearing, you have taken some tremendous courses. You've taken uh, living in balance. Let me see. Uh, the rage uh, and a number of other things. And you have convinced me today to take a chance on you. So my vote today is to be to grant your parole with the following conditions. Number one, that you be on curfew from uh, 9 a.m., 9 p.m. to 6 a.m., uh, that you follow all of the sex registration requirements and rules that you will have to do. Uh, I'm also going to order that you attend three AA meetings per week. Uh, I also am going to suggest that you report to your uh, parole supervisor weekly for the first 90 days. You are to have no contact whatsoever with the victim in this case, unless she for some reason chooses to contact your parole supervisor to have such contact. You are not to make any contact whatsoever with her. I'm going to also suggest to you, I'm not going to suggest it as a requirement, your parole supervisor may, if you get released, I'm going to suggest that I'm not going to prohibit you from having access to a computer or the internet, but I am going to suggest that you strongly stay away from any websites involving pornography or anything like that. Yes, sir. Do you sir. understand that? Totally agree. Totally agree. Madam Chairman, that would be my recommendation and the conditions under which I recommend them. Thank you, Mr. Marabella. Ms. Wise? All right, sir. I, um, I do feel inclined to take a chance on you. I'm glad to see the family support that's present today. That that, that was a, a factor for me. They really influenced. So my vote is to grant for the reasons already been stated. I concur with the conditions outlined with the added that probation parole provides you with random drug screens. I don't know how feasible truck driving is going to be for you, but you, you're going to have to be flexible in that because you are a sex offender as to what, what kind of employment you can do. But good luck to you, sir. You've done Thank it before, you. you can complete it again. Thank you, ma'am. All right, uh, Mr. Absher, I, uh, I concur with my colleagues. My vote will be the same for the same reasons with the same special conditions. Do you understand all those conditions? Yes, ma'am, sure do. All right, I hope, I hope, I wish you well, and I hope we don't see you again. <laughs> Me too. All right, good luck. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. All I have to say is I hope that, I really hope that uh, the fa stepfather who was there is not the same stepfather of his stepsister whom he did that to. Nothing would surprise me that we've seen it all. But can you imagine, you know, again, the one thing I feel that wasn't properly uh, represented in this case was the the victim the survivor uh, they didn't really get into the details now he was nine and a half years in on a 10-year sentence I, I he happened to have you know a really good interview he said all the right things except for the one part where he said what did he say he said something along the lines of nothing what I did was was he used words that were a little bit off and I, I, I didn't write it down it was like nothing that i did was was honorable or nothing that i did was was good and no one can say it was like yeah of course it wasn't you know but 
Otherwise, it seemed like he had prepared for the day. Now he he's uh, Richard shared you know quite a bit of information with me. Now remember he he was given parole and for this crime, and he was revoked uh, for. So he was convicted in 2012, and then he was revoked after he didn't properly register, and that's why he ended up back in to serve his full sentence. Otherwise, of course, he wouldn't have served his full sentence, right? And so, you know, he was a moron, and I always congratulate the, the, the parole process and parole officer for, for locking him up. Actually, it looks like I'm wrong. I'm sorry. The the what I'm looking at here. Let me just share my screen with you so you can see it. Uh, let me just make sure there's nothing on here that will get us in trouble. So, this hearing took place on on two three twenty twenty one, and this article that I'm about to share with you took place on. July 8th, 2021. So immediately after he was released, he did get rearrested again. So on July 6th, he was the convict, right? He was arrested after an investigation revealed he failed to comply with his registration requirements. On June 26th, he contacted the parish offender unit, advising no longer lived at his registered address and advised you to be meeting detectives on June 29th to update his address. Why does he have to meet with detectives is interesting, unless they had reached out to him to find that out. And then he failed to meet with them and he was rearrested. Now, his his the, the information that we have says that he's not in jail, he's out. So uh, I, I don't know what that means. But yeah, sure enough, this guy with this brilliant interview and has everything under control uh, seemed to have violated pretty quickly. And again, I don't know why he's out, though. But, yeah, I thought that was what got him revoked to begin with. Because, remember, he was locked up. He got revoked, is my understanding, and is back. And that's why he has a medium risk score, not a low risk score, because of his write-ups, which is unusual, and because he he had gotten real. But here, so he was charged. Let's go over the crimes. He was charged in 2011 with possess, possession of CP. In January 12th, he pled guilty to the lesser included offensive in, indecent behavior. And isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting just from a legislation perspective is that it's a lesser charge if you do it with a child than if you just have possession of videos of a child. Make that make sense. It's a lesser charge. He took a deal. Um, he took a deal that he's going to plead that he actually did something to a child physically versus having CP because it's will be a lesser sentence. Make that make sense. <laughs> can't make it up. You just can't make it up. He was sentenced to 10 years, including two years without benefits. He did not appeal. He is now serving his time. Uh, in July 8, 2018, he filed a pro petition for damages against Willie Shaw, former Shreveport Police Department, um, and Alan Crump, uh, Shreveport entities, uh, unnamed insurer. He alleged that the only in November that it only in November 2017, pursuant to Public Records Act, he did receive his complete file. Um, act, did he re receive his complete file? This disclosed to him for the first time various acts of official misconduct, such as allowing civilians to handle evidence, destroying evidence that was expul exculpatory, unlawful search and seizure of his phone, obstruction of justice by refusing to turn over a video. I don't know what 212 years means. Uh, he also alleged that he was totally free from fault. And that a result, as a result of police misconduct, he suffered extreme um, prejudice. Prejudice. He demanded that the entire amount of plaintiff's damages will be proven at trial in this matter. 
plus legal interests in general. So basically, he's saying that he received like all the discovery and I guess the all these packets that finally came to him. And when he was reviewing, he was like, oh, man, all this stuff is crazy. And then he like sued. And uh, this wasn't the first time he sued. Richard shared with me he had actually sued two other times. He sued one time where they said that they, he was like filing a complaint, mailing it out, and the the prison did not let him mail it. And he said that his rights were violated. And then he sued another time. Um, but this guy likes suing. You know, he seems like such an angel, and, and right? But no, he was... He was a, a trouble prisoner. Oh, he sued because he got in a, he, he was in a fight, found guilty, and he was fined $5. And he sued over the $5. He also claimed that he was completely indigent and he uh, wanted to get, I think, compensate, uh, to have everything like comp compensated because of that on, on his behalf. I am not quite sure, but. Um, but yeah, he was, he was, there was nothing really interesting in here. I read that, but anyways, uh, to get, and I'll drop the links in here, but to get back to the, to the point of this, what we know for sure is that he was doing something to his step sister. Um, she was under the age. Uh, he also had images on his phone, whether it was her or someone else we don't know uh it's not clear um and he got 10 years which uh which i understand he got out earlier but then i think he did something to get back in but either way it's it's What can you say? It is what it is. You know, I didn't think they brought up what he what he did, how old she was. The, the, they didn't go into those details. They just didn't want to for whatever reason. And the, the victim, the survivor, again, was left out of it. That's why it's so important that an assistant DA shows up, in my opinion. But with that, I'll let you go. Another 745, 724. All right, that matches what I have. Uh, Mr. Miller, I'm Cheryl Renatz, and my colleagues are Mr. Alvin Roche, Ms. Pearl Wise. I'm going to read some identifying information into the record, ask you to confirm it for me. Then we'll start the interview process, and we'll start that with Mr. Roche as your case has been assigned to him. And once we complete the interview, we'll hear from Warden Bickham, and then you can make a statement if you'd like to before we reach a decision. Yes, all right. So, <clears throat> Mr. Miller, you're classified as a first felony offender. You're currently serving a five-year sentence for aggravated assault with a firearm. You have a parole eligibility date, October 24th, 2021. Good time date, January 25th, 2022. And your full term date, July 25th, 2023. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Would you answer Mr. Roche, please? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Miller. How are you? Good morning, sir. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for asking. Mr. Miller, you are currently 32 years old, and you've been incarcerated approximately two and a half years on a five-year sentence. Is that correct? Yes, sir. When was your last disciplinary write-up? I ain't have a write-up since I've been in DOC. Outstanding. Outstanding. One Bickham, it is my understanding that he is currently enrolled in Cage of Rage, Living in Balance, and pre-release. Is that correct? Yes, sir. He's also in parenting. So he's also in parenting. So he's going to get approximately 90 days for Cage of Rage, 120 days for the pre-release. 180 days for living in balance and about 60 days with parenting, right? Yes, sir. You're probably thinking the same thing I'm thinking right now. Yes, sir. Yeah, and he's going to max out at 360 days. And if he does that, 
to be an immediate release because his good time date will fall back to January of 2021. Close. I'm thinking around April is what we're figuring, somewhere around. Yes, yeah, so it'll be close. April. So his parole date is not until October, and we don't want to hold him back. Right. So I'm planning on to uh, deny his request and let him complete all those programs, and he will be released sometime in April of this year instead of October. Yes, sir. That's what it appears. Sounds like sounds like a good plan, Mr. Miller. Yes, sir. <laughs> I have no further uh, information to enter into the record. Miss Wise, uh, Mr. Miller, uh, the records show you have six years of education. Is that correct? No. Uh, do you have any plans on trying to you know, work toward GED or literacy or anything? Yes, ma'am. Well, good. Yeah, I, I strongly encourage you to do that. You'll be amazed at what you can do. Good luck to you, sir. Mr. Miller, I don't have any questions. Is there anything you'd like to say to us? No, oh, ma'am, just thank y'all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're prepared to vote, Mr. Roche. Uh, Mr. Miller, I'm going to de deny your request because you're currently enrolled in parenting, living in balance, Cage of Rage and pre release, and your good time date will supersede your uh, parole date by four or five, six months. And for that reason, I'm voting to deny your request. Ms. Ms. Miles. Uh, Mr. Miller, I also want to point out it looks like in your record, uh, when you get out, you're going to be on probation as well. And there are some special conditions ordered by the judge, mental health evaluations and such. I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Uh, so when you go in the office, ask the office about the probation in case it doesn't pop up. So my vote is the same as Mr. Roche for the same reasons. Best wishes to you, sir. Uh, and I do uh, concur with my colleagues. That's my vote as well. So uh, usually it's a bad thing when we deny somebody. But in your case, it's a good thing because you're going to be when you finish your programs, you're going to be in immediate relief. Well, pretty close. Yes, good luck to you, sir. Good luck. Thank you. Y'all have a good one. Thank you. All right, Warden Bickham. Thank you. We'll adjourn at 1117. Well, we'll go over what he got his five-year sentence for, and it's not pretty. And it's kind of shocking. You might say shocking unless you've seen enough of these hearings to know that it's... Uh, just Louisiana for you. Thank you, Richard, for pointing it out. Um, okay. A man arrested after barricading a 16-year-old girl inside a home last week now faces additional counts over in, after investigators discovered that he had a three-year relationship with the now pregnant teen. So she was 13 years old. Police said the 30-year-old Curtis uh, held the girl hostage inside a home in 1000 block on July 25th and then tried to run away. The teen told Miller slapped her a number of times and pointed a weapon at her. Officers found Miller after a brief pursuit that night and arrested him. When detectives interviewed the girl the next day, she told them she and Miller had been in a relationship since she was 13 years old. She's currently pregnant with this child, according to the police report. Miller, who is in East Baton Rouge prison, will now face five counts of indecent behavior with the juvenile. He was initially booked for aggravated with the firearm, imprisonment, blah, blah, blah. And guess what happened? Guess what happened, ladies and gentlemen? Guess what happened, dear Louisiana? They just dropped all of that. What's the big deal? <laughs> right? She's a child. She's a 13-year-old girl that he impregnated. Hmm? What's the big deal? You think what? You think we should charge him for that? You think we should make him register? You think that we should try to protect other children? No, that can't possibly be the, the DA's job. That can't possibly be something that 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 law enforcement would would well, I guess not law enforcement, the, the DA, you know, law enforcement did everything they can do. 
I got this new lighting and, and green and green screen for the first time. And thank you so much to my Mandalorians for, for doing this. You know who you are. And I give you a shout out in a, in a, in a members only live stream. I hope you saw it. Um, and now I'm trying to figure out how to make it all work. But yeah, he, he's not, I mean, on the register. He doesn't even need a register. Explain this to me. Explain to me how, when this happens, the assistant DA would say, we have not a smoking gun. We have a royal flush. We have all the evidence laid out on a silver platter. Our job could not be easier. We have a baby in her belly, the DNA that can prove that he was, well, she's only 16. The age of consent Louisiana is 17. You have him right there. It started at 13. You have enough. You have enough to get better than a five-year plea deal. You have enough to put him on the registry because that's where he belongs. But no, 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 they don't do any of that. They show up. His his public defender says, oh, uh, you know, let's five years. Oh, the, 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 the judge says, hmm, yes. Uh, prosecutor says, yes, five years is good. Prosecutor, uh, the judge says, five years, okay. That's it, done. There's no vic victim. Who cares? Future victims, who cares? Registry, what's that? Make it make sense. Make it make sense, Louisiana, please. You know, this is stuff that they want to hide. They want to bury under the rug. They don't want people to know about. Because if their constituency did, the, the, the people that vote them into office, you think that they would say, wow, you're doing a great job. We want to vote you in again. Thank you, Richard, for pointing this out. You know, when you see the hearing, it's only a few minutes long. That It's like, it's not, but when you go in, under, right, when you look at it at a glance, it's like, is this even worth showing the, the YouTube community? Is this worth showing you guys? But when you look it up and you see and you see it, the facts of the case, you're like, you just want to rage. You just want to say, why? How is this possible? Our system is broken. He doesn't have to register. He was not held accountable for what he did. To that little girl, 13 years old. Why does that offend us so much? But it doesn't mean anything to the people put in charge of protecting our families, our children, our society. How is that possible? You have a child in her womb. The DNA will match. You have this case, Dan. You can put him away for the maximum. You don't need to give him five years. All you have to do is play a little bit of chess and say, we have this evidence. It's going to be, you know, you don't want to go to trial. You know, it's going to be 20 years or we will go to trial. You'll get life. Whatever the maximum is anymore. They just drop it. It's, it's, they just drop all the charges. Why? You didn't see it. You wouldn't believe it. But it's the truth. With that, I'll let you know.